was an English clergyman who left the best description of the Ebo Valley in the years before industry made its mark, and when this was still a largely remote and unknown area. Touring Monmouthshire in 1801, Archdeacon Cox commented that few visitors ever came to these districts, explaining, These upland areas are the wilds of Monmouthshire, and seldom visited by gentry except for grouse shooting. He asked why so much red flannel was worn by locals, only to be told, well, it is warm and comfortable, prevents colds, and can be worn longer without washing. The valley, he wrote, is bounded by ridges of hills, feathered with trees and traversed by mountain torrent. The scenery here is wilder and romantic, the plain narrower, the acclivities steeper, the torrent more rapid and confined, the woods more gloomy and impervious, the streams pour down through the glens and rush down the hills in greater abundance, and there are fewer habitations. Hebervale, like other heads of the valley's towns, came into existence almost overnight, it seemed, because of the rich seams of coal, iron and limestone lying just beneath the surface here. This narrow east-west belt was the coal field's northern edge and became known as the outcrop. Small-scale iron working had taken place here probably since prehistoric times in charcoal-fired bloomeries. Although local coal was already being used domestically, it could not reach high enough smelting temperatures, and by the 18th century, when much local tree cover had been stripped to make charcoal, primitive smelting along the outcrop had all but died out. Coal and ironstone were obtained either by scouring or patching. Scouring entailed trapping water in ponds and then releasing it suddenly through channels to wash away topsoil and expose ore. Rasa, meaning water races, takes its name from this, as does Skurva, which is scouring place. Patching was a method of digging away small areas of the overburden by hand to reach seams lying just beneath. When the sides threatened to collapse, a new patch would be opened thus producing the ravaged and pockmarked landscape once flanking the A465 road between Beaufort and Brimmau. In 1778, a drift or level was opened just above Beaufort to reach the deeper deposits. Unfortunately, it was driven southwards following the dipping seams and consequently flooded. Later levels were usually cut slightly upwards to allow workings to gravity drain. Bloomeries were primitive stone-built furnaces either blown by bellows or by natural draft. Some seem to have been built in moorland swallow holes, where their chimney would project into the prevailing wind to increase draw, perhaps resembling this ancient lime kiln west of Treble. Two early small furnaces or bloomeries seem to have existed in the Abervale area, one below Domenvaur, where ancient slag deposits were recorded. It was not until the early 18th century, when the Derbys of Ironbridge, Shropshire, successfully experimented with coke smelting, that it became possible to exploit local iron and coal deposits. Blast furnaces appeared to supply demand created by Britain's Industrial Revolution and European wars. By 1790, a small furnace was operating at what became Ebba Vale, producing some 25 tons of grey iron each week, carried by pack mules to Glangroiny Forge in the Ask Valley to be beaten by water-powered trib hammers into wrought iron merchant bars. In 1801, when Archdeacon Cox visited this region he termed the Wilds of Monmouthshire, he would describe the beautiful valleys of Ebu and Sorrowy in hollows between mountains shady with trees, their numerous farmhouses, small enclosures of corn and pasture, and a people whom he thought lived more comfortably than peasantry elsewhere. Sadly, he left no description of Ebervale's first small furnace, although he considered the upper valley wild and romantic. Yet only ten years later, a local writer would mourn changes that had taken place, the increasing despoilation, the meadows covered with slag and the stripping of the vale's remaining woodlands. Valley lands claimed to have been very fertile and renowned for their wheat higher than a man's head was constantly disappearing. In the century's early days, a writer was claiming, the appearance of this valley has been marred by all kinds of refuse from forges and pits. Its once lovely meadows are, for the most part, now covered with huge black tips which on every hand offend the sensitive eye. 
Much of the beautiful woodland that once adorned its sloping sides had been considerably stripped of their pristine glory. Even in the 1860s, local people were lamenting the loss of fields once waving with golden corn, then being covered by worthless ashes and rubbish tips. In these early days, local ironstone was already being carried by pack animals to Brecon and other furnaces. Carts were also being used locally. There are records that mine, that is ironstone, went to an early Ebervale furnace from a level above Toyna Nant, conveyed on carts through the woods. Local trackways were soon in a deplorable condition, an account stating, often mine wagons and horses would sink down on them so low that it was with great difficulty they were extracted. Mine was ironstone, the men who dug it out of the ground being miners, while colliers, that is colliers, were those who cut coal. There was a clear distinction between the two occupations. In his history of Breconshire, Theophilus Jones claimed that the greatest part of the country districts were supplied with Ebo Valley coal for fuel, carried to the various towns by pack train. At the coal works they pay about three pence per horse load, and sell this for one shilling and sixpence, a six times increase, in Brecon in summer, and two shillings in winter, an eight times increase. Early production was limited by the maximum loads pack animals could carry, normally 300 weights, that is 152 kilograms. By 1794 the Monmouthshire Canal was linking Pont du Anneth and Crumlin with Newport and the sea, and Ebervale products began travelling down the valley on the horse-drawn Beaufort tram road of 3 foot 4 inch, that is approximately 1 metre gauge. Built by the Canal Company to carry Ebervale and Beaufort output to their Crumlin Basin, it also linked northwards with the Rasa tram road serving Sir Howie Works. A mid-century writer recorded, This tram road was originally laid with square rails, each three foot long, and each end resting on a block of stone. It was surveyed in 1792 and completed in 1793. It was operated by horses, which made two journeys a day. In 1790, Walter Watkins and Sir Jeremiah Homfrey, brother to the Sam Homfrey who was ironmaster both of Tredegar and Penadaran in Merthyr, built Ebervale's first furnace at Penakai Farm. Three years later they were joined by the Harfords, Quaker capitalists, and by 1796 the works had passed entirely under Harford control. The company's first balance bit of 1803 was possibly the number one sunk near Rasa. Although at first successful, by 1842 financial problems forced the Harfords to sell out to the Derbys of Colebrookdale. Valley bottoms were too narrow and irregular for industry, and like other local rivers, the Ebbo's course was changed by slag tipping to create level ground. At Drissiogachach Farm above Briary Hill was a large field needed by the Harfords. The owner steadfastly refused all attempts to persuade him to sell, even an offer to cover its whole surface with half-crown pieces. It was only when he died was the company able to buy the field from his sons. Earlier, Jeremiah Humphrey, faced with a similar problem, had solved it by sighting a navy encampment close to the lands he desired. Soon the owner, stripped of livestock and anything else movable, was forced to sell. New industries needed workers, and like other iron towns, Ebervale attracted many from rural districts. In spite of belief to the contrary, country people flocked to the outcrop to take advantage of better opportunities, money and housing offered by the new industries and towns. Even as late as 1869, a commission on Monmouthshire agricultural districts employed such phrases as overcrowding, great misery and wretched cottages. Workers toiling from dawn to dusk on lowland farms would look towards the southern hills whose furnace smoke made them seem an iron Eldorado. Along the outcrop, men worked only 12 hours a day for six days a week. They had money in their pockets and leisure time to spend it. Houses had to be provided for the many hundreds arriving to find work, Wesley and Rowe being typical of the period. Workmen's cottages built by the Ebervale Company were considered model dwellings, whitewashed annually inside and out for hygienic reasons. Tenants had to accept strict conditions. 
Different categories of workers had different housing. There were controls of what lodges could be accepted, even the beds provided for them. Being Quakers, the Harfords prohibited public houses brewing or sale of alcohol on their lands, but Briary Hill, which did not belong to them, would become notorious for its many drinking houses. Furnace work and heavy industry produced prodigious thirsts. Farmers on Harford lands were also required to provide horse teams for company transport and haulage when required. It cannot be overemphasized that without horses and mules, this region's early industry would have been impossible. Like many other companies, that of Ebervale was remarkably paternalistic and benevolent. By 1845, an ironworks school had been built to educate workers' children. But many families could not afford to send their children to school, and illiteracy remained common. Even as late as 1841, a government report stated, the extensive and populous neighborhood of Ebervale remains destitute of almost every educational resource, excepting that of inferior Sunday schools at the sectarian chapels. This was perhaps a sweeping overgeneralization. Non-conformist Sunday schools certainly encouraged many to read and write. It was normal for a child to start work at seven years of age. Some commenced even younger. A collier who carried a child to his workplace could claim extra timbering, or trams that would allow him both to produce more and be paid for it. Slight though it may appear by today's employment standards, Abram Darby's wife ensured all women workers were provided with strong aprons and shoes free of charge, together with washing facilities where they could clean off working dirt. The past can only be judged by the standards of its own times, and in contradiction to established beliefs, most ironmasters did what they could for their workpeople and families. Like most other companies of the day, Ebervale operated the truck system, whereby workers were paid mainly in credit for goods at the company shop. This was necessary for works that were developing far from any shops. That of Ebervale was remarkable for its time, being well managed and charging fair prices. Little evidence remains of these early days, most having been swept away by later developments. A remarkable survival is Big Arch, dated 1813, a magnificent structure built for a horse-drawn tram road taking iron, stone and other charging materials to the furnace bank. Between 1790 and 1823, three coke-fired blast furnaces were built against the hillside here to allow top charging with coke, iron and limestone, molten iron being tapped into sand moulds at their base. These so resembled suckling pigs that cast iron bars became known as pigs or sours. Even today the term pig iron is still employed. One of the original semicircular furnace blasting arches is still visible on the site. Throughout the 19th century, furnace charging was done by hand. In the early years, men and women carried baskets of ore, limestone and coke to tip them directly into the furnace mouth. By 1900, the only change was that baskets had been replaced by iron hand carts, each containing a 100 weight load. Grey iron, as cast iron was often known, took its name from much earlier iron working in the Sussex Weald, where local ore contained tiny shells known as greys. Keen competition existed between early iron companies. Early in the century, the Harfords purchased from the Burr estate some upper Sahawi Valley lands on which Sahawi ironworks had been built. Sahawi was at that time in close partnership with Tredegar, and when its 21-year lease expired in 1818, the Harfords offered to renew it on what many considered reasonable terms. Even though he knew that by owning the land, Ebervale also owned anything standing on it, Fothergill, Sir Howie's ironmaster, refused the offer, and knowing his works would be seized, in rage ordered tram roads torn up, and all movable equipment stripped. Eventually, Sir Howie passed it to the hands of the Ebervale Company, with Fothergill forced to pay a huge fine of £6,000 in compensation, an enormous sum by today's standards. Tredegar and Ebervale controlled Sir Howie became hostile camps. Fighting broke out between them, and for a time it was dangerous to enter the other's territory. Tredegar responded by refusing to puddle Sir Howie iron, 
and in 1832 the Harfords at a stone arch tunnel one and a half miles, that is some two kilometres in length, driven through the intervening mountain to Evervale. A new tram road via Rasa also eased the problem and incidentally avoided tolls payable on the canal company's Rasa tram road. Industrial transportation continued to develop rapidly. Even though the outcrop had rich mineral resources, they were far from sea ports and world markets. At first, horse or mule pack trains were used, but by 1794, the Brecon and Abergavenny Canal Company had constructed their railroad through the Clinach Gorge, linking Sahawi, Beaufort and Ebervale with Glangroiny Forge, where Usk and Groiny Rivers joined. After 1800, when the canal was complete, horse-drawn wagons continued carrying Ebervale iron to Glangroiny, with coal and limestone being loaded onto canal boats at Gilwern for sale in Brecon and beyond. Lime had long been in demand for agricultural and building purposes, but now increasing production from larger and more efficient furnaces required ever more limestone for flux. Pack horses or mules were limited in what they could carry, and although operating in teams of 12, the reason everything was bought and sold in dozens, that is 36 hundredweights, these animals could not cope with demand. But attach a horse to a wagon running on smooth plates and it could move a far greater load. As a result, in 1794, the horse-drawn Treville Railroad was built to transport limestone from Treville quarries to Beaufort and Ebervale furnaces. Treville village developed, some 400 metres above sea level, on lands owned by the Duke of Beaufort, near quarries worked by Tredega, Rumney, Sahawi, Beaufort and Ebervale companies. With their lease expired and almost worked out, in 1936 the newly arrived Richard Thomas Company renewed this lease, also negotiating another on lands some 150 metres higher at the Dufferin Crownland's head. A standard gauge railway was laid on the old Treble Railroad route between Ebervale and Treble, continuing north to the new Astrid and the later Hendra quarries. Between 1938 and 1951, the company extracted over 5 million tons of limestone here, the bulk transported to the furnaces on wagons hauled by steam locomotives. These crossed Ebervale's main shopping street almost every day until 1964, when rail gave way to transportation by road. And even today, that part of the town is still known as The Crossing. Ebervale continued developing steadily and in 1829, during the railway craze, would produce the first iron rails rolled in Wales to supply the Stockton and Darlington Railway Company, rails on which Stevenson's rocket would run. Ebervale products for shipment from Newport travelled down the tram road to Crumlin, the company paying tolls both on this and on the Crumlin-Newport Canal section. But even this was not an ideal route, the 14 Lux flight slowing traffic considerably. Yet canals are the advantage that one horse could move on water some eight to ten times more than on a tram road. But as furnace and works output increased, horsepower could not cope. Some new method of moving heavy loads efficiently and cheaply was needed, and the answer proved to be steam locomotives. The company began also introducing steam locomotives to replace horses both in their works and on the Beaufort Crumlin tram road. The iron horse that would revolutionise transport had arrived. The Harfords had financial connections with Quaker companies in the USA, and when these suffered defaults and serious financial problems, Harford's British interests were so damaged that in 1844 they were forced to sell to other Quakers, the Derbys of Colebrookdale in Shropshire. Under these new proprietors, the company began again to flourish, and in 1848, the Victoria Iron Works were purchased from Lord Lenova, Sir Benjamin Hall, whose nickname, Big Ben, incidentally, was given to Westminster's new bell. The Abersachen Works, with its six furnaces, was also bought at this time. Great industrial developments were taking place. In 1850, Ebervale Company's chemist, George Parry, designed the first efficient blast furnace cap and cone, which by greatly improving top charging and trapping formerly wasted hot gases for reuse, revolutionized iron production. 
By 1863, 100,000 tons of rails and merchant bars were being produced annually, much shipped from the company's six wharves at Newport. In 1864, new forges and mills were erected to serve the new Bessemer steel-making converters then introduced. Chemist George Parry had already invented and painted it his own process, which the company sold to Henry Bessemer for £30,000, Parry receiving 10000 of this. Bessemer's process involved blowing hot air at high pressure through white-hot iron held in a specially shaped vessel, thus burning off carbon and manganese impurities rapidly and cheaply. There is some controversy over who should be given the credit for designing the cap and cone system. One school of thought is that Thomas Williams, also an Ebervale employee who had studied blast furnace systems in France, brought the concept from there. Another is that it was a development of one already in use in Derbyshire. Whatever the truth, both Ebervale Company and Henry Bessemer had no doubt that Parry was its true creator. Steel now replaced the slow iron puddling that depended upon a craftsman's eyesight and skill, even though this product was long considered far superior to steel. Abervale was one of the first works in the country to adopt the Bessemer system, and even when rebuilt in 1938, three converters were included in the scheme. In 1957, a fourth was added, all operated by traditional air blast. Local ironstone was not only being worked out, but was unsuitable for the new Bessemer process. Ore to supply the steel converters began arriving from company-owned mines in Somerset and the Forest of Dean, even from Bilbao in Spain, and new mills were constructed to roll steel rails and billets. The emphasis had changed, and by 1868 the company was reorganized into the Ebervale Steel, Iron and Coal Company Limited. New pits were sunk to supply the works, Wayne Floyd in 1874 and Marine Colliery in 1889. Even at the time, it was recognized that underground work was the hardest and most dangerous of all employment offered by the company. In 1867, a mining engineer described conditions in a neighboring valley. For six months out of twelve, the collier does not see the light, Sundays accepted and for the remainder of the time he sees it just before going to work in the morning and after six o'clock in the evening. Seldom do they eat of animal food more than once a week. As a rule, certainly not. It was normal for steel men and colliers to work a 12-hour day six days every week. After 1873, working hours were reduced first to 10 and then in 1907 to 8 hours a day. However, Ebervale Blast Furnace men still worked 12-hour shifts during the week and 10 hours on Saturdays. In 1860, Christchurch was built by the company as a demonstration both of its Christian fervor and commercial prosperity, although the intention to use locally produced iron for its spire and floors had to be abandoned. There arose a magnificent Victorian church, still possessing outstanding stained glass windows, that towered over town and works, exemplifying the confidence and skill of 19th century Ebervale. Unusually for the Church of England, as it then was, an immersion font was provided under the West End floorboards. Ebervale's Literary and Scientific Institute was built in 1853 to encourage all forms of education, especially science. The former iron industry was evolving into steel production, and industrial chemists were vital. George Parry, Ebervale's brilliant chemist, must have known this place well, perhaps even using facilities here. By the 19th century's end, the Ebervale Company had become a huge integrated organization, owning and controlling almost every aspect of production, including all supplies in and transportation from Norway and Spain, as well as its own limestone and coke supplies. By the 1920s, it would own a Northamptonshire iron ore mine, as well as a metal sleeper pressing plant transferred from Ebervale to Newport and capable of producing 10,000 units a day. Industry was expanding throughout the valley. Just to the south of what became Victoria, only a small coal level seems to have existed in 1837 when Sir Thomas Lethbridge and Company, a group of West of England businessmen, built four furnaces at a works they named Victoria to mark the Queen's coronation that same year.
At first, it was not a success. An 1839 iron trade slump caused the Monmouthshire and Glamorganshire Bank to foreclose on their £25,000 mortgage. But the bank's attempts to operate the works by themselves also failed, and in 1848 they were obliged to sell out to the Abbeville Company. But there would be accidents. In 1875, an explosion at Victoria No. 1 pit would kill 18, but worse would follow. Marine Colliery had been sunk in 1895, and Cum Village developed around it. Like all pits, this had its share of accidents, but on Tuesday, March the 1st, 1927, there occurred a huge underground explosion, its cause uncertain, killing 52 workers. A plan drawn up at the time numbered where their bodies were found, even the dead ponies and house stones had been driven into timber props. These cold, factual details record where men were hurled through workings by an explosion powerful enough to embed surface stones in solid timber. Many would have been killed, mutilated or asphyxiated where they stood, while pit ponies were burned and destroyed while still attached to their trams. The tragedy reverberated across South Wales and it was estimated some 70,000 people arrived to witness the funerals that Sunday. Tragically, two more died and several others were badly injured as an indirect result of the disaster when the bus carrying them to the funeral ran out of control in the sharp bend above the colliery. One of the dead was a Welsh international football player. In such a small community, this was an especially dreadful disaster, one family losing its father and two sons. Twenty-two funerals took place five days later. The remaining dead could not be buried until their bodies had been recovered. Only a colliery ventilation shaft and some machinery remains today to mark a colliery around which grew a thriving village. The iron and steel industry had passed through periods of fluctuation, but there was an increasing demand for water. To satisfy town and company needs, between 1905 and 1911, Ebervale Council ordered a tunnel to be driven, some three miles long and in places triple lined with Beaufort brick, northwards under the moors towards the Kleisfer Springs. Surprisingly, little water was encountered, and when bad ground was met just short of the Kleisfer Valley, the scheme was abandoned. Having cut through limestone strata and riddled with caves and passageways, it now provides access for cavers exploring the extensive systems beneath these moors. Even though the works were at full production, in 1911, Lord Ronda and the directors would shut them down for nearly 11 months in the belief more profit could be made from coal. But furnaces had used large quantities of otherwise unsaleable coal for their coke ovens. And with the realization a valuable market was being lost, Abervale reopened. However, by 1913, even though several other outcrop works had relocated on the coast and their imported ore supplies, the Abervale Company had confidence enough to build its magnificent and expensive new offices. Galvanized steel sheets were now in demand and the works reorganized to supply them. One year later, when the 1914-18 war broke out, South Wales steel works and coal pits returned to full production, which would be maintained throughout the period. In 1914, what was known as Mill's Army, a contingent raised from Ebervale workers, marched off to war. It is hard to comprehend that a number of these Ebervale young men would die in France and never return to their former workplace. Even those who did return would not find a home fit for heroes, as David Lloyd George had promised, but a town that would suffer from the dreadful unemployment of the interwar years. In 1915, when coal pits and steel works passed under government control, South Wales' heavy industry was in a sense nationalised. Military demands and manpower shortage meant women were employed in large numbers for the first time, something that would fundamentally change local society. During the war, Ebervale produced tens of thousands of 18-pounder and 8-inch shells, three new furnaces being opened at Victoria to cope. The tragedy of war, many local men lost their lives, 
did bring with it a new prosperity which lasted into the early 1920s, a period when 25,000 would be employed. When the war ended in 1918, there arose new hope for the future. The company building Garden City near Briary Hill on a site then overlooking the Prince of Wales Colliery and the later Coke Ovens. The colliery had adopted this name to commemorate a visit made by Edward, Prince of Wales, on February the 21st, 1918. Pitt and Ardens have now vanished, and this well-designed suburb now lives up to its name. Because of its dependence on the two heavy industries of steel and coal, South Wales suffered greatly, firstly from the 1926 national strike and its aftermath, and then international depression. In 1929, when Ebervale works were forced to close, massive unemployment was created in the town. By 1934, there was 54% unemployment in the town. Only Mountain Ash at 57% and Merthyr Tidville with 62% had higher levels, all three being harder hit than any other town in the coalfield. At one annual meeting of the Ebervale Iron, Steel and Coal Company, the chairman, Sir John Bynan, told assembled directors that the Government Industrial Commissioner then believed that if the works could be reopened, the unemployment problems would be solved. He was derided for making such an obvious statement, but it was true. By December 1934, the government, concerned that the appalling conditions existing throughout South Wales and fearful they might lead to major social unrest, declared it a special area. Attempts were made to establish light industries, but these little improved the situation of unemployed workers in these coal and steel towns. There had never been any mass employment alternative to heavy industry in these valleys. Apart from those who went to college or university or worked as service providers, most boys grew up in the firm belief that their future lay in making steel or hewing coal. By 1935, when the situation was desperate and hunger and deprivation commonplace, new hope appeared throughout the region when Richard Thomas and Company, who had intended building a US-style strip mill in Lincolnshire, was persuaded by government to establish their new plant at Ebervale instead. Purchasing the bulk of Ebervale Company assets for £508,851, Richard Thomas announced it would build a modern steel plant on the site, together with a wide hot strip mill, the first to be constructed outside the USA. The results were dramatic. Between 1936 and 38, 4,000 men were employed to demolish the old steelworks and create a 400-acre site for the new project. Money began again to flow into town and area. New housing was built, shops and cinemas appeared. Overnight, it seemed, the black days had vanished, and there was a new hope and prosperity throughout the whole region. In September 1938, the first blast furnace was lit, and two months later, the five-stand strip mill began operation. With cold and hot rolling mills in production, there was once again well-paid employment, and money began to pour into the local economy, bringing new life to depression-struck local towns. It is difficult to overemphasize what Ebervale's rebirth did for local economy and people. Suddenly, by the standards of the time, there were thousands of well-paid workers spending money throughout the region. So, too, had the drain on government funds decreased. A year or two earlier, it had been stated that the nation could not afford to continue paying unemployment benefit to those living in areas where there was no possibility of work. There was a limit to the length of time men should be paid for doing nothing. By the mid-thirties, poverty had created some appalling housing conditions. Many were living in slums, and serious suggestions were being made that certain South Wales Valley's towns should be knocked down and their populations relocated either in the Usk Valley or on the coast, where employment was more likely. Amazingly, it was estimated this could be cheaper than constantly paying the dole. But for the 39-45 war, Cumbran Newtown, or something very much like it, might have appeared much earlier. But again, a world war saved the area. During the 39-45 war, Ebervale made a massive contribution to the national war effort. 
It was commonly believed German bombers could never find this Mandelshaw Valley and the works would always be safe from attack. Yet, this photograph discovered in Luftwaffe archives, taken directly over works and towns, shows how misplaced was this belief. Yet, there were those in authority who realized aerial bombing was quite possible, and an alternative Ebervale works target. In reality, a cluster of sheds filled with combustible materials was built on moorlands north of Treble. The plan was that if Ebervale came under attack, this could be set alight, and mislead German bombers into attacking it, rather than the works themselves. Even when the war ended, Ebervale continued developing. In 1945, Richard Thomas linked with Baldwin's to create a company amongst the UK's largest, with the first electrolytic tinning line outside the USA. The steel nationalisation of 1949 seemed to guarantee a secure industrial future, and even when denationalization followed in 1953, Ebervale remained in state ownership. By the 1960s, Ebervale was the United Kingdom's most advanced steelworks, possessing Britain's first LDAC, top-blown oxygen steel converter, evidence of security and industrial well-being. By 1969, Ebervale's new galvanizing line was the most advanced in the world, the work's eventual workforce of over 9,000, making it the region's economic heart. Central to all processes were three blast furnaces, tapped every four hours to pour between 150 and 200 tons each cast, and producing, incidentally, 30,000 million cubic feet of gas annually for use in other parts of the plant. Steel was Ebervale, and Ebervale was steel. Blast furnaces extracted iron from ore by heat and combustion of gases given off by the coke. Ebervale's furnaces were fed continuously with iron ore, coke and limestone, to be tapped at four-hour intervals. The blast came from three turbo blowers, each of which produced up to 50,000 cubic feet a minute at 30 pounds pressure air that was passed through separate heating stoves. Hot blast meant higher production, and Ebervales would rise to 350,000 tons each year. Inside the furnace, temperatures could reach 2,000 degrees centigrade. In their later period, these furnaces were injected with oil, which was found to increase yields. Furnace coke was made in coke ovens, of which, in the early 1960s, there were 109 all fired by their own or furnace-produced gas. Each was charged with some 14 tons of coal, which spent about 17 hours in the oven. After that time, 10 tons of coke, 1,500 weights of coke breeze, 90 gallons of tar, 31 gallons of benzyl, 238 pounds of sulphate of ammonia, and over 158,000 cubic feet of gas were produced. Each year, these ovens would consume 600,000 tons of coal. By 1960, a million tons of ingot steel were being produced each year, with over 30% of finished products being exported. From the blast furnaces, hot metal was transported by railway in 60-ton ladles to three mixers, the heated storage vessels, which could hold 600, 1,000, and 1,400 tons respectively. Overhead cranes carried huge ladles of hot metal from mixer to four oil-fired open-hearth furnaces, each of 120 tons capacity, fed with some 35% of hot iron, the remainder being cold scrap. In 1960, the UK's first top-blown converter was commissioned, followed by two others. These three 36-ton capacity vessels were filled with molten iron through which oxygen was blown at supersonic speeds by means of a water-cooled lance. Finished steel, regardless of by which method it had been produced, was then cast into 13-ton ingot moulds. This great works, exporting to some 60 countries in all parts of the world, and a major supplier to British industry, could only, so it seemed, go on from strength to strength. Lorries, heavily loaded with Ebervale coiled strip for Midlands car industries, rolled regularly down Black Rock. Clear evidence there would never again be unemployment and hardship in these Welsh valleys. By 1967, the steel industry was once again nationalised, becoming the British Steel Corporation. 
world producers were facing difficulty, and it was believed UK concentration into large units could economise both on labour and capital, and thus increase competition. The famous British steel logo was accepted, a brilliantly simple design of bent slabs in the form of a letter S. Ebervale works then comprised blast and open hearth furnaces, an LD converter shop for steel making, soaking pits where the ingots were reheated, slabbing mills where they were rolled, hot strip mill for the first reduction into sheets, a cold reduction mill to reduce sheet thickness, three electrolytic tinning lines to convert strip into tin plate, plus numbers one and two galvanizing lines producing zinc-coated strip. It was a huge and integrated operation. But even though future prosperity seemed assured, disaster was looming. British and world economic conditions were changing, and in 1970, Lord Melchett, with government approval, announced a ten-year plan under which, between 1976 and 79, iron and steel making would be phased out at Evervale followed shortly after by the strip mill's closure. But it would not be the end. Ebervale, it was announced, will have a secure future as a major tin plate and galvanized sheet finishing plant in which there will be substantial future investment. But even though 4,500 workers would lose their jobs, hope remained. The works were still there, operating in a different and slimmed down form, certainly but with potential to develop and increase production if required at some future date. By 1971, construction began on a new hydrochloric pickling line, an 8.5 million investment that would be commissioned in 1974. The future looked even better when in 1973, British Steel Corporation announced a multi-million pound phase one tin plate development for the works. Amazingly, between 1976 and 79, this massive scheme was carried out with production remaining very largely unaffected. Number 5 electrolytic cleaning line was installed together with 51 single stack annealing bases, a double reduction temper mill and a coil preparation line. Number 4 electrolytic tinning line would be built as were number 4 and 5 cut up lines coil inspection and assorting facilities, new cranes and other plant. There was even a new effluent plant to help protect the environment. £57 million pounds were spent to make Ebervale Europe's largest tin plate plant. Its production increased by some 35%, that is 100,000 tonnes annually. In this narrow valley, space had always been at a premium, and although some existing buildings could be used for the new equipment, other areas had to be cleared to provide sites for the rest. Between 1972 and 73, two waste tips were cleared, one of which contained some half a million tons. That was not all. The drill ground park and Gorseth Circle standing on top of it had to be relocated onto a new site opposite Blyna Gwent Civic Buildings. On this newly made ground, buildings would rise, amongst them a fully automated tin plate warehouse, which at a cost of 12 million was one of Europe's most sophisticated storage units. Another 9.2 million would be spent to modernize the number two temper mill, newly commissioned in 1990. But a price had to be paid. In March 1972, Ebervale's blast furnaces and converter shop were phased out, as were the coke ovens. In September 1977, the hot mill rolled its last coil, and on May the 19th, 1978, the last cast was tapped from its open hearth furnace. Three days later, the last slab was rolled. After more than 200 years, industrial scale iron making had finally ended in this valley. Yet such radical changes with all their problems did make Ebervale a cleaner town. For the first time since the days of Archdeacon Cox, the area could present itself as something other than a place of smoke, slag and fume, and amazingly a wonderful opportunity presented itself. For many years, a large part of the old Victoria works site had been used to tip slag, producing a mountainous heap of solid waste. 
Now, with the arrival of Richard Thomas and Company's new works, ladles of white-hot furnace slag would be carried here by rail to be poured, cool and solidify. From Domenvaur high above, this was a spectacular sight, especially on a winter's evening. But it had created a desolation, a harsh grey landscape where nothing, it seemed, could ever grow again. But there was to be a local miracle, again bringing hope for the future. In 1986, clearance began of the old iron and steel making structures, colliery remains and slag heaps, all bulldozed away and leveled to create a site for the fifth and last National Garden Festival. To those local people who had lived with the huge 19th century slag heaps and the surrounding 20th century wasteland, the venture seemed madness, even impossible. Was this not an industrially fouled and poisoned area where nothing could ever be expected to take root? Yet, by 1992, a magnificent parkland had been created to an outstanding design that combined the old slag mountains with lakes, grasslands, trees and flowers with remaining natural areas. Walkways led the visitor past superb flower beds, fountains and lakes to exhibition halls, theatres and restaurants. There were water gardens and Japanese pavilions, even a huge greenhouse filled with exotic plants. Musicians played and choirs sang during this magical summer when colour and music filled the valley. The very statistics seem incredible. 330,000 trees, half a million plants and flowers, plus 150,000 bulbs were planted on a site nearly two miles long and 1,200 feet above sea level. During the five months of its existence, there would be a distinct and different flower festival every four weeks. Over two million visitors would arrive to be amazed and delighted at this transformation of a once destroyed area into a wonderland. From the outset, it was intended the festival would bring long-term benefits and not allow to become run down and derelict as had happened elsewhere in the UK. With the festival's closure, part of the site was turned into a business park and a shopping mall built, together with a modern housing development, all taking advantage of the festival's landscaping. In the belief this would point the way ahead, town and company looked forward confidently towards the new millennium. But the world was changing. There was no longer a large British industrial base and former markets were being lost to lower cost foreign producers. On the 21st of July, 1999, Sir Brian Moffat, chairman of the British Steel Board, announced that, despite initiatives to improve efficiency, British Steel continued to incur losses. A decision was taken to merge with Hoogevans, a Netherlands company, and create what would become known as Chorus. But even though restructuring and job losses followed throughout the industry, nothing seemed to halt its decline. Such was the constant financial drain that in February 2001, Chorus announced South Wales steel making capacity had to be cut drastically and Ebervale Works would be finally shut down. Cutbacks had been expected. The company was losing vast sums daily, but the proposed closure came as a body blow to an area where unemployment was already high. Whatever its social and economic effects, this is the end of an epoch. For over 2,000 years, probably since prehistoric times, iron has been worked in this valley, while the enormous production of the past 200 years has molded its landscape and people. Now the last heavy industry of an area that once supplied iron, coal, steel, galvanized and tin plate to the world has come to an end. They were not the only products. These South Wales Valley towns also produced amazing men and women, resilient and resourceful, many of whom made their mark upon area, country and world. Amongst them, of course, was an Iron Bevan, constituency MP, who as Labour Minister of Health introduced the National Health Service. Perhaps this dramatic turning point in South Wales history will result in new industries able to capitalise on the skills and abilities of its people, and with them will appear a new direction and a new prosperity. Let us be hope that in the words of Winston Churchill during another time of threat, this is not the beginning of the end, but the end of the beginning.